Hello, and welcome to tonight's GTA Lug meeting. Um, uh, tonight our speaker is Gary. He's going to be discussing about his childhood writing malware software. Um, but before we begin, i um, just like to remind you, if you have any questions, please approach the microphone up there. And without further ado, Gary. Hey. Thank you for having me. Um, I met Scott at the DEF CON Toronto meetup. I don't know, three weeks ago? Something like that? Last month. Yeah, so I gave my presentation. This is a presentation I gave at DEF CON in Las Vegas for DEF CON 18 about seven years ago. Um, so unfortunately, this talk has nothing to do with Linux, but hopefully it's interesting still. I can't even present it on my Linux laptop, but I don't know. For my cred, I think I originally installed Red Hat 4 on a 386 and tried to make sure I got the refresh rate on my monitor correct so it didn't explode. And yeah. Um, so this is my talk, Malware, Bad Life Decisions and How to Make Them. Um, when I first started presenting, I never had any graphics, but I realized using Google Im Image Search, you could quickly and easily make your presentation slightly more interesting. Um, so this presentation is full of really bad cyber crime images that I found. Uh, who am I? So my name is Gary Paisky. Um, I've been making software for about 20 years. Um, my last job, my main workstation was a Linux machine. Um, I've been a developer, a consultant, a team lead, an architect, um, sales engineer, product owner, and now I work at Rogers as the director of search. Um, I've only been there two months, so I know it still sucks, um, but we're going to work on it. Um, I think every job I've had has been in a different industry. I've made internet casinos, dating websites. I've made software that runs in a nuclear plant um, and malware. All right. Um, why am I here and why am I giving this talk? So uh, not a lot of people seem to be willing to talk about writing malware. Um, so I learned a few things by doing it and wanted to share that knowledge with everyone else. Um, it's pretty interesting, I think. Um, and the main thing is to tell people not to do it. <laughs> um, but something I don't have here that is somewhat interesting is like, when I was doing this, I didn't have any kind of like security background or, you know, actually know what I was doing around writing that stuff. Um, so I think the, the positive thing that came out of it is just realizing like, um, you can just figure out whatever you set your mind to, you can probably figure out. Um, and it's not about knowing something. It's about being able to research it, learn it, and just do it. Um, so hopefully you can apply that to something less sketchy than malware. Um, so the image of this slide I put up because every security presentation I've ever seen has this picture. So I wanted to include it as well. It's a security gate where people are clearly driving around it. It has nothing to do with the content of this slide. Um, so the year was 2004. I was living in Edmonton writing pharmacy software. Um, I didn't want to live in Edmonton anymore because it was too cold. So I moved to Vancouver. And I didn't really have a plan. I had a bunch of money saved up, but that was really about it. I started doing contract development work. And eventually, I ran out of contracts and I ran out of money. Um, so I went to the best job site in the world, which is Craigslist. And uh, yeah, someone on there was looking for a developer. Um, so the job wasn't super specific. Um, I went in to meet the guy, and he didn't really know what he was doing. And he was like, yeah, we're writing like, I think he sold it as like advertising software or something like that, which is a very flattering way to put it. Um, and he was basically like, hey, if you want the job, show up on Monday, <laughs> which is a pretty rigorous interview process. Um, so I showed up on Monday, and uh, there was five other people there, and he put me in charge of them because I think I had the best English. <laughs> uh, because he certainly didn't know about any of my programming skills. Um, yeah, and as I said before, like I didn't have any experience in writing this kind of software um, so who was this company? So 
my boss was being paid by some third party to develop malware. Um, they originally tried outsourcing it to India. Apparently, they were successful and built something cool that worked quite well. Uh, but they had some kind of falling out, and that falling out was um, he didn't pay them. So he didn't get the source code, he didn't get the software, and we were plan B. So he was going to rebuild this thing in, locally in Vancouver with people that he could um, rip off in person, I guess. Um, so what did the software do? So it was... Uh, back then, we didn't, I didn't really have the terminology for it, but the software would get installed on a Windows machine, and we could have it run any application we wanted. Um, we weren't super creative. We weren't really uh, thinking of crazy things to do, but we would add, like, links to the browser on the desktop, uh, add icons, shortcuts all over the place. We could change the home page, the default search engine. Um, the main way they were attempting to make money was to create referrer links. Um, so if you don't know what that is, uh, most e-commerce websites have a referral program. Um, although I don't know if that's really the case anymore, but they certainly used to back in 2004. And um, let's say you go to Amazon. If you went to Amazon through a referral URL, um, they would assume you went there from another website and that because you sent them there, you would get some kind of cut of whatever was purchased. Um, so the strategy was um, anytime someone goes to a website where we had a refer program set up, um, the URL would redirect the user to, let's say user generously, let's say victim maybe, um, would end up on the website um, through the refer link. So with the idea we would make a uh, commission off their purchases. Um, we also have the ability to like hyperlink any word that showed up on the page. So, yeah. Uh, I I have slides on that. <laughs> um, so basically, the configuration, it, the application would download this big XML file that would have all these keywords in it, um, and then it would have the refer links related to the website they were going to. Um, so, for example, flowers. We had there's tons of different websites where you can buy flowers. So anytime the word flower showed up on a website, we would hyperlink it. You would click on it. You would go to a specific website. Um, on the server side, we had a PHP application that would um, track installs and updates. You could manage these campaigns, as we called them. So what, did, what executable do you want them to upload or run on their machine? Um, and you could upload new versions of the software. So that's kind of the functionality. Um, in order to make sure the installations of the software stuck, um, I don't know, we came up with the name polymorphic installs. Um, maybe there's a more security related term to this. Um, but basically what it do, what it would do is when it would install on Windows, um, it would, the files generated would be randomly generated and they would be put in random file locations. Um, so every install would be different. You wouldn't know where the files were. Um, but they would have a way to communicate with each other, so it would know where to find the data file and the DLLs and all that other stuff. Um, and back then, antivirus software is, was not very sophisticated. I don't know if it's any better. Probably not. Most software is garbage. Um, and it would just do a, a hash check on each of the files, and if there was a match, it would delete the file. That's really how sophisticated antivirus software was back then. Um, and back in the day, back in 2004, um, we tried out with like every antivirus software we get our hands on and uh, none of it was able to remove the software. But I think it's like it's a blacklist system so they would have to discover our software, they would have to write some kind of algorithm to detect it. Um, I don't know if they would have the capability with the random file names, random locations, and the random file content. Um, but that's what we were doing and it seemed to be quite effective back then. I don't know if that would still be the case now. Um, we were also started looking into alternate data streams, which is a NTFS feature um, that would allow you to kind of like hide files within the file system. Um, it does have some legitimate uses, but we were kind of poking around to see if there's a way we could use that in addition to hide our files. Um, something else that we do, I can't remember if I have a slide on this, but we, as long as the software was running, you wouldn't be able to see it on the file system. So if you're looking for it running in Task Manager, you wouldn't see it there. 
Um, you wouldn't see it in um, Windows Explorer. You wouldn't see it if you were like listing a directory on the command line. Um, so that was all part of the software as well. Uh, affiliate hijacking. Um, so I already talked about this one. So this was kind of the, the primary money making idea behind the software. Um, so the kernel module is what we did to hide the files. Um, it would, if you did find the file and you deleted it, um, the, the software that was always running would detect this and automatically, uh, download the latest version of the installer and randomize everything all over again. Um, so these days you'd probably call this a rootkit, but back then, um, yeah, it was just software we were writing. Um, so how we built it was, uh, this didn't make me very popular, but I said it had to be done in Visual Studio or Visual C++ six, and that's because um, every version of Windows since ninety five had the uh, the libraries to run the software out of the box. Um, .NET had just come out, and everyone wanted to program in that easier language, but uh, because the .NET libraries weren't a part of most installs. Um, even if you're writing like a 5K application in .NET, it would still need to download like a 200 megabyte .NET library to run it. Um, so the uh, the hook into Internet Explorer was a browser helper object. Um, this is how all Internet Explorer plugins were uh, written, and you know you could use that for good or for evil, and we used it for evil. Um, on the server side, we had PHP. Everything was stored in MySQL. Um, these are running on, actually, I guess these were Linux boxes. So, uh, there's the Linux connection. And these were hosted on Russian servers and with the promise that they would never take anything down off their site that they were hosting. Um, and true to their word, uh, the Russians never did. Um, how did we spread this software? Because obviously no one would ever want to actually install this. Um, so, my boss said he would pay $10,000 to whoever figured out how to do a remote install. Um, to do a remote install required two different things. Um, you need to get the installer on a remote machine, so sitting on the file system, and outside of kind of IE's like protective security zones or whatever they called it, so you could actually execute it. Um, so, you know, I didn't know anything about any of this stuff, so I just signed up for every security list I could find and just waited until a new exploit was discovered. Um, and it didn't take very long. This was back in the days of Windows XP Service Pack 1, and Microsoft never really took security seriously until Service Pack 2, so it was basically the Wild West back then. Um, so there was a flaw we discovered, or I guess I did, where you could hide an executable within a CHM file, which is a compiled HTML file, um, which most help files were written in back in those days. It's probably not really used anymore. Um, so that would get the executable on the remote system, and then you were able to, within the hyperlink, um, reference the default path for Windows Media Player, and you could call the CHM file with the exe extension embedded in it, and um, it would actually execute that exe. So it was, it was almost magical. Like, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was trying a bunch of different things. And then one thing I did suddenly worked. So I would browse to my test page and an exe would just execute automatically. Like it was like the craziest thing. <laughs> it's like this shouldn't be happening. And yet it was. And it would work on every machine out there. Um, surprise, surprise. My boss never paid the $10,000. Um, apparently he was a gambling addict and I'm assuming he took the money that the third party was paying him and probably gambled it all on something stupid. Um, so the executable, I can't remember how big it is. I've got it on a CD somewhere. Um, but the internet was slower back then. So you wouldn't really want someone browsing to a page and then waiting for it to download the full installer. So we uh, created what I call a stub installer. I think it was 2K. So it was like the absolute smallest executable I could create that would download the, the main installer and execute it immediately. Uh, what the idea is, all it would really need to do is download a 2K file, and then even if they browse to another page, the installation process had already kicked off from there. Um, this is what the installer looked like. Um, so my boss was trying to cover 
um, himself legally. So we could have just had the executable run immediately, but instead he created um, or had someone else create this installer, um, which obviously does not look like any kind of um, installer you've ever seen. So it's like it's got spelling mistakes on it, and it, it tries to sell this thing as like, hey, like you've won an amazing new piece of software. It will change the way you experience the internet. Do you want to install it? Um, and you had to be very careful once this thing popped up because what you had to do is if you click the, the close button in the top right, it would execute. If you click the close this window button in the bottom, it would execute. You had to unclick the checkbox at the bottom of the page that doesn't have any text beside it. And then you have to go to the top left MFC icon and bring down the context menu and then choose the option that said quit without install. Um, so this actually links to a terms and conditions page. So his idea was, we put this up, we give them the option of accepting the terms or not. Um, so, you know, every piece of software you install has some kind of um, terms and conditions associated with it. And, you know, maybe this is actually somewhat legal, but I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. Um, but very difficult not to install. Um, so how did we deploy this? Um, so we've got this software that is bad. Um, we've got our exploit that will allow us to install it on basically any machine back then. Um, and again, back in, this would only work on Internet Explorer, but this is back when Internet Explorer was like 95 percentage of the um, Internet. I don't even know if, I don't think Firefox was out yet. It was still Mozilla. And that was mainly it. A few people using Opera, I guess. Um, so I don't know if this is still the case, but to run a banner ad is kind of weird. Again, this is for 2004. You would sign up for one of these banner companies, and you would give them the URL from where you were hosting the, the banner ads yourself. They didn't host them. You hosted them, which is like automatically a problem for security. And websites don't know what banners are running, and we wouldn't know which sites we would end up on. So we would, we had a bunch of banners made up. Um, we would host the files ourselves, so the HTML, the CSS, and all the images. Um, so the campaigns would run a while. They would go to a legitimate page where you could buy stuff. And then after a few days, we would open up a zero pixel iframe to the exploit. Um, and you could configure it so that it would only work for a tiny percentage of the users, um, to kind of like make it harder to repeat the install. Of, People figure out what was going on and were attempting to backtrack to see what went on. Uh, we wouldn't try it on incompatible web browsers, so we would check to make sure, is this Internet Explorer? Does it look like a vulnerable version? Although at the time, there was no patch. Um, and we never tried the same IP address twice. Um, so if someone accidentally installed it and tried to figure out what went on, uh, theoretically, they wouldn't be able to. Um, my boss is a bit greedy, so I think he just had the, the install percentage cranked up to 100% all the time. Um, so this ended up getting installed on 12 million different machines, um, which is a lot. <laughs> but basically, the vast majority of any um, anyone on the internet back then, assuming they were on Windows and using Internet Explorer, even if they were, had all the latest security patches installed, um, this thing would basically get installed in the machine. And if you... Um, automatically closed the window or weren't able to successfully decipher what the installer was asking you to do. But these days, we would probably call this a botnet. Back then, we didn't really have the language for this. And, you know, this day and age, we wouldn't be messing with referral links. We would just install a Bitcoin miner and be done with it. Um, so how much did we make? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So all the affiliate programs that were set up were shut down immediately. Um, typically the day before they were supposed to pay us. So there was normally like a 60 wait day waiting period before they would pay you out. Um, and the day before they would close things down. Um, so how did we make money? We still made, well, we didn't make a lot of money. My boss made a lot of money. Um, so he made money through installing other people's shitty malware. Um, so back then, companies were willing to pay us. Apparently, I wasn't involved on the business side. 10 cents an install of their software. Um, 
And my boss would create these packages, or have them created, um, of up to 20 different packages of, of these software. So every install we were getting, he was potentially getting paid $2 per install, times 12 million machines. Um, and also only about 60% of people apparently would pay us. Um, so that's a lot of money. That's a ridiculous amount of money for not really doing a lot other than just having a banner ad. Um, so what happens when you install 20 pieces of malware at once? Um, so, you know, we made the decision to write everything in Visual Studio 6 to keep things small, uh, but not everyone was um, that efficient. Um, they did write in .NET, and it, you could see the software install the .NET framework, like, not even silently, like, the installer would pop up and you would see the progress bar go down, like, it was, it was ridiculous. Um, and some would even un in attempt to un uninstall their competitors, um, who were temp tempting to do the same thing, and some would even install antivirus, because if they had written their software in a way where their malware was, like, invisible to the antivirus, um, the hope was it would scrub everyone else's stuff, so it would only be their malicious software on the computer. Um, I also wonder if those companies were getting paid to install antivirus, which would be very interesting, uh, but I don't know. Um, so what did it take to do all this stuff? So it, it didn't take any experience. We were able to figure it out. Um, no conscience, which, I don't know, for a while I was able to justify it my, for myself. Like, I needed the money. It was an interesting technical challenge. Um, you probably need a good lawyer. My boss claimed to have one, but I suspect that wouldn't have covered me. Um, people that you can trust. Um, so... What ended up happening is uh, the guy running, funding the whole operation, the guy I was reporting to, the gambling addict, he, I'm assuming, disappeared with a bunch of money. We showed up one day and um, on payday, of course, and the doors were locked and we were all standing around wondering what was going on. Um, so I went on to work for the guy funding the operation. He knew I was running the team. So rather than having me and five other people do it, I was just doing it in my spare time. Um, and he only would work with his family because he knew he could trust them. Because when the money was this easy, everyone who was part of the original operation was like, well, what do I need these other people for? I can just do this myself and make all this money. Um, so everyone was kind of like stabbing each other in the back. Um, and uh, the vast majority of the work, the software part was almost too easy. Um, the bulk of the operation was like setting up these affiliate programs, reaching out to these other people that would pay you for software, and uh, trying to get them to pay. So I think that's where the majority of the effort was. Um, yeah, so one day there was no one there. Um, I went out to work. Again, like, I took this job because I was short on money. And then when I didn't get paid, I needed more money, so I went to work for his boss. Uh, because I was doing myself, it was 80 hours a week. Um, and it was definitely burnt out after a while. Um, and then I just like, it, like I realized what terrible things I was doing and I wasn't okay with it anymore. Not that I w ever really was. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it's super depressing. Like we created this software that, um, probably ruined machines and, they weren't even making money off of it the way they thought they would. Like, it's just so bizarre. Um, and this period of my resume is listed as contract work. Um, although if you Google my name, this is the kind of stuff that shows up anyway. Um, yeah, so the interesting thing about it is, like, the original idea for the software, like, made no money. But despite that, people will try. So, like, even if the people that I was working with, they went on to try to do their own operations around this, even though they knew, they should have known better. Like, the people that were attempting to make money with this and were unable to still thought if, like, they shifted things, like, half a degree, they'd be able to crack the code or something like that. Um, so they still tried. And even if that doesn't work, you can make money off of people who think that they can, like the people that were paying us to install their software. Um, I don't know. I always kind of thought of it as, like, the gold rush where... The people panning for gold weren't the people that made any money. It was the people selling them all the tools. I think it was a similar approach here. <coughs> uh, 
And I realized blacklisting, blacklisting um, software was not a good approach to dealing with malware. I always wondered why whitelisting didn't take off more, but I guess that's kind of the approach that we have these days um, with security. Like, only run these applications if they come like from the Apple Store or the Microsoft Store or whatever. Um, so I guess maybe we did get to whitelisting. Um, so what did I learn? So creating malware was not hard. We were just able to figure it out. And um, this is kind of the, the positive lesson here is like, you know, anything, like don't worry if you don't know something. And like if you can figure it out, that's all that really matters. Um, but hopefully do something good and not bad. Um, you could make a lot of money doing this, at least back in the day, back in 2004. Uh, malware production was useless <laughs> at the time. I'm not convinced it's much better these days. Um, it's probably not going anywhere, and it hasn't really. Um, yeah, and it's 100% not worth compromising your integrity to attempt to make a quick buck, even if you're desperate to pay rent. Um, and the additional point is what I said before. is like, you know, you can figure things out if you don't know how to do them. Um, questions? Um, it it kind of looks like maybe I need to go away from the speaker. It kind of looks as if this is a fast form of evolution going on in front of your eyes or whatever. So the world probably is quite different now, but with lots of similarities. Yeah. And I guess the main evolution was get paid up front. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Or like, I don't know, I think cryptocurrencies are still, you know, there's been a bit of a crash, but they're still worth quite a bit of money. If you could install some kind of miner on that many systems, you're probably going to do quite well. Um, and I think one of the things we were smarter about we would have done has been a bit more subtle about the stuff getting installed, where, like, if that thing got installed, like, there would be pop-ups. You would know instantly that there was some kind of problem with your machine. But if you were more careful and didn't raise any suspicion, um, you probably could have gotten away with producing more, I guess. Yeah, that was kind of the evolution I was thinking of. If they're smart people rather than greedy people. Yeah. Um, I mean, all this stuff with persistent threats and so on, you don't even know if you have them. You, if they're smart, you'll never know. Exactly. Um, so I guess that's where evolution has driven them. I guess I would have preferred no evolution so everything was obvious. But you know what? These people are... The people funding the operation were not technical. They were certainly greedy. So I don't know if they would be capable of taking a more patient, long tail view of making money. They would probably always go for the quick buck. <laughs> Isn't the fundamental message that if you deal with sleaze bags, you will get screwed? Yes, 100%. Um, I know that seems 100% obvious in hindsight, but I don't know. I like to. I was desperate at the time, but there were alternatives. I could have like gotten some high interest loan or like asked my parents or something like that. It was it was the wrong decision, and like I definitely regret doing it. And one of the reasons I give this talk is like hopefully like. If anyone's considering this or something, that uh, they don't. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, how, how do you have any like thoughts, or have you studied any of the your kind of malware? Like, it's like crypto miners, but when you visit a website, stuff that's come out. Yeah, I, I so I've done quite a bit of JavaScript programming, and I always wondered like, there are JavaScript libraries that. Um, can mine for Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies, but it's not super efficient because 
Um, they don't really, it's not great for floating point math. Um, although I think there is, uh, uh, last year or sometime I read something about, you know, browsers taking advantage of video cards to do faster floating point math, and that just sounds like <laughs> inevitable that it will go towards Bitcoin mining. There was some kind of security story I was reading this week where um, all these, a very similar approach, like there was some kind of browser exploit that was installing miners on tons of machines. So, you know, it only takes one crack for these things to get into the system. So as good as security gets, their security will always be on the defensive. And a lot of people don't apply patches. I think operating systems are more insistent these days and browsers. Um, but there's probably always a significant percentage of things that are insecure and not the latest and greatest. So how sketchy was the office that you were actually working in? Um, so it wasn't bad. It was uh, downtown Vancouver. Um, I forget the street. It's been a while, but it was, uh, it was not super sketchy. Like it was in an office building. Um, and then when I was working for the guy funding the whole operation, I was just working out of my house. So that was a little bit sketchy, but that's my own fault. Or just get an onslaught of heavyweight JavaScript from legitimate sites, or yeah. what we call legitimate sites. Yeah. That just, you might not notice if somebody was, was mining on your machine because it's already hit so hard. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, if they're smart, they will, again, not raise awareness that they're doing something bad. Um, so it actually may be hard to tell. But nowadays there's some, there's a war trying to make JavaScript faster and faster. Yeah. And I guess one of the, I don't follow it completely, but one of the technologies they're trying to promote is JavaScript that looks like assembly language and gets jitted into actual assembly language. So you would expect the performance to be not half bad. Yeah. Um, so I've never played with that myself. Um, but I have been programming a node and it's funny to me, like JavaScript was a language that was created in 10 days back for Netscape Navigator. And like somehow it has become the most popular language in the world. And node is somehow ridiculously fast and become more popular than languages that were specifically designed for doing that work. Like it kind of blows my mind that this language has accidentally become so performant and so fast. Um, so, you know, it's the language that's taking over the world on the front end and the, the back end. <coughs> so, yeah, there's going to be a lot of focus on making it even faster. As fast as it can go. I'm not surprised that it's going to be working at the assembly level. Yeah. about your current occupation yes why do you guys have so many different domain names that co that you log in with that then causes like incredible amount of phishing problems um are you speaking about roger specifically yes um so i've only been there for two months so i don't know the history oh, on everything okay <laughs> um but i will say the road to hell is paved with good intentions um and a significant effort right now is being done to unwind previous good intentions. Okay. One of the things you mentioned, well, somewhat throughout, is that uh, blacklists don't work. Um, are there techniques that are worthwhile? Are there things that we should be watching for uh, that might help to uh, to find malware and to uh, to help unwind this particular problem. Um, there's there may be things that aren't really much worth doing, but maybe there's maybe there is something. Yeah, that's a good question. So I don't know, like you know, a lot of like like 
chips are not made in this country. Like, who knows what stuff is getting put into those systems. And I've seen a DEF CON talk where a compiler would was maliciously written so that any executable it generated would also include the same exploit as the compiler. Like, it's... At some point, if you want a computer that works, you have to trust something somewhere. And you can be as careful as you want, but again, it only takes one crack to get in. So you never really know. And, you know, if people are stupid and greedy, like the company I worked for was, like, it's obvious immediately that you've been compromised, but, you know, the smarter people will, you will hopefully never have any idea. And it's difficult to tell. I don't know. I usually reformat my machine every six months or so, but, um, you know, who knows if that actually does anything good. People have talked about putting exploits in the boot sector of your hard drive or something like that. So who knows what's hiding there or writing to some chip so that when it boots up, it's doing something bad. Like, yeah, I don't know. I think that goes back to one of the Unix luminaries. I, I think it was Ken Thompson who wrote a compiler that would have... Uh, that would put bugs uh, bugs in and would reflect reflections on the reflecting crust something like there's a chain of word left here. Yeah. This is a little bit off topic, but there's uh, I saw a really good talk at DEF CON um, called Reverse Engineering and Psychological Warfare. And it was all about people attempting to analyze malware and how you could write your software in a way that would mess with them. It's uh, highly entertaining. I recommend watching it. Um, he did a bunch of different things, and one of the things he did is he wrote, apparently the OR command in assembly is Turing complete. So he had a compiler that would compile only to OR commands. So if you're attempting to look at this in the disassembler, it would like be nothing except OR commands. Like, how do you figure that one out? Um, I. Yeah, you should watch the full talk. I don't want to spoil anything. It's way better presented than I could describe, but it's like, it's hilarious. <coughs> Is there anything more you can give us as a pointer to that? So, psychological warfare, DEF CON. Um, yeah, well, let's Google it right now. You're typing a Google search. I thought I was tethered. <laughs> Looks like I am. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, good keywords going on. Are, are, are a fine thing. Yeah. Oh, it's connected to my Linux laptop, which is not <laughs> actually on. That would explain a few things. This should do it. I was uh, plugged into the wrong computer. There you go. Um, yeah, and actually, while I'm talking about it, um, DEF CON Toronto is great. There's lots of cool people there. Um, DEF CON in Las Vegas, the, the original event, is super fascinating and always a good time. Um, the first time I went, I, like, again, I didn't know anything about security. Um, I thought every, all the talks would be completely over my head, but uh, the community there was super inviting and open and love to teach you cool new things. Um, so you ever got the opportunity? It's like, I think it's, when I originally went, it was like $90 for the whole weekend. Now I think it's like $280. Um, still quite affordable for a three-day conference. Um, I highly rec recommend going. It's, it's a great time. Lots of, it's probably the only place I've been to where I feel like I was <laughs> surrounded by people that think the same way I do. Like, hey, how does this work? Um, uh, like, let's figure out if we can make it do something else. And I don't know, just uh, success. <coughs> Slow success. There we go. So Chris Domas is the uh, speaker. 
Recyc, Psychological Warfare, and In Reverse Engineering. Uh, there's so many good, great DEF CON talks that are highly entertaining. Uh, but this one is probably one of my favorites. Uh, it's the same video. Uh, one is posted by DEF CON, and the other one's like hackers on board. My talk originally at DEF CON was originally posted by someone else, and that one has like 160,000 views, and the official DEF CON one has like 300. So. Yeah, exactly. Like, well, you know what? That's one of my new responsibilities at Rogers, so. <laughs> What does Rogers do in search? I'm a Rogers customer, but I don't think I'm using Rogers search in any way. Um, so go to rogers.com. They have internal site search. So my most recent, and I know it's not very good right now, we're working on it. Um, yeah, so my previous job, I was at a e-commerce startup called Group Buy, located by the distillery district. Um, I was in charge of their search engine, which was their primary product. Um, so I left there in February, moved over to Rogers, um, and the plan is to fix their internal search for Rogers and Fido. Um, but I discovered last week I'm also responsible for organic search, so SEO. Um, so that's some of the project I have on my plate. <laughs> What's that? Oh, just organic CEO, like Google searching as well as internal. Like they're two yeah. different. But it's searching the name. <laughs> well, you know what? That's exactly it. So no one was doing SEO, and I was the only person with SEO or search in the title, and that's literally how it happened. <laughs> like I went in thinking I was responsible for the back end systems because everything SEO related is on the front end. Yeah. But no one else really knew about it, so I said, sure. Be careful what you want to for. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying you didn't read the fine print in a Rogers contract? Well, I read the fine print, it was not there. <laughs> It's, uh, my role is <coughs> growing organically. I have another question. Um, so I've like, for most of my entire life, most vulnerabilities seem to happen through some type of browser extension exploit. Why do you think that's still going on? Like I, a few months ago, I was, I had to help somebody who had one of the banking extensions that was capturing the logging credentials to different banks installed. It seems to me at some point, some intrepid browser would be like, we need to fix this. Yeah, well, I think, I suspect what's happening is they probably, they can't close that hole out without breaking a lot of functionality. Like at the end of the day, like it's an inherently insecure concept. It says, I've got this browser. I want to treat it like a platform that will allow anyone who wants to write a plugin for it to kind of do what they want. Hopefully it's secure, but you know, once again, it only takes one crack and you know, if 90% of your add-ons are using the functionality and you can't close that hole without breaking something, like it might just end up being a business decision, but I, I don't use any as well. It's, I have, like, the, the one I was talking about was a, I think it was installed as a Bible reader, which I've been noticing for, like, at least the last 10 years has been a common way people have been getting on computer, like, getting software maliciously installed is downloading a free Bible reader, and then all of a sudden, like, you have malware there. Um, yeah, well, which Bible saves <laughs> Yeah, it, it's really strange. Actually, there, there's a local Toronto guy who's like actually does write a legitimate Bible reading application and charges like 20 bucks for it. So I'll get you the name if you want a good Bible reading. <laughs> but yeah, and basically it's, they're really well written. Like these are people who are trying to steal, like do transfers out of bank accounts. So they're pretty high level. They do one thing. They'll get the login information for the banking system. They'll then capture how much money has been in the banking system and 
what I've noticed is whether or not it's only interest payments for the last few months. And if it's only interest payments in the last few months and no other activity, those are the accounts they'll target. They won't target accounts that have like constant daily kind of things because they know that will be, get caught by any ba any smart banking automated system. They'll go after the ones where it's like, you know, a buck fifty every couple months off the interest. And they're like, that no one ever checks that one. We'll just like drain out the entire bank account. They generally make three different transfers of different amounts to three different bank accounts, which I'm assuming they're all under their own control. So that sounds like you studied this deeply. I did. I, I spent I spent about five months doing it in different VMs, trying to like get the software installed, giving it fake. I spent a lot of time building fake baking infrastructure <laughs> <laughs> and tricking it. Yeah, I. It's it's really fascinating, and it's also made me question IBM, as I think they're involved in this because IBM has a free software that the banks are paying for for any end user to install on their computer. It's available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. And basically, it does complete check of your browser security while going on any of the banking sites and basically prevents any of the information. I'm not the speaker, though. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. <laughs> I'm happy that there's a conversation. Um, anything else? So, uh, I didn't transfer this is banking malware. Yes. <laughs> I'll clear now. Um, thank you for having me. So, at the end of every Sayalog meeting, we head off to the library, which is a local pub in the Imperial, the top floor. Um, just follow the horde or follow Alex down here. Or Scott, please put your hand up. Sullivan. Thank you, everybody.